everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. Are you eating your moon drop grapes, Nikki? No, but I will <laughs> eat the cotton candy ones. I don't know anything about this. We've been talking about the uh, genetically modified <laughs> grapes outside of the show, and apparently they're quite delicious. Uh, uh, I just wish that... They, re- I, w- I wish that grapes really did taste like cotton candy, but I know that it's fake. <laughs> it has to be I'll something I put a, not right. With I that. put a lot of fake stuff in my food. It's yeah. it's fine, but cotton candy is not the first thing I would have expected no. in a grape. Um, <laughs> no. uh, but we we are on that subject. We're talking about natural approaches to navigating ADHD. And before you think, oh, natural approaches, that's like uh, it's a bunch of hooey. It's not. We're talking about sleep mm-hmm. and nutrition and exercise and how those three things. Uh, help you live with your ADHD more comfortably. Uh, And uh, we have a fantastic guest on the show. Aviva Nirenberg is here. Aviva is a new coach to uh, take control ADHD. Uh, We love Aviva. We're so glad to be able to introduce Aviva to you on the show today. Before we do that, head over to TakeControlADHD.com. Get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show on the website or subscribe to the mailing list right there on the homepage, and we'll send you an email with the latest episode each week. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Pinterest at Take Control ADHD. But to really connect with us, head over to our Discord server. You can jump into the general community uh, and uh, uh, chat with us uh, with everybody in the public channel. Visit TakeControlADHD.com slash Discord. You'll be whisked over to that general invitation and login page if you are looking for a little bit more. Particularly if this show has helped you you or touched you and helped you live a better relationship with your ADHD, we invite you to support the show directly through Patreon. Patreon is listener-supported podcasting. With just a few dollars a month, you can help guarantee that we continue to grow the show, add new features, invest more heavily in our community. Visit Patreon.com slash The ADHD Podcast to learn more. Nikki, do we have news? Not right now. We want to go straight We're to news Aviva. Free. Excellent. Then let's pull back the curtain. Aviva, let us begin. Aviva Nirenberg has ADHD in the family, mom of three with ADHD and non-ADHD spouse of a husband with ADHD. Her coaching career started with the lived experience in helping her family navigate the world while living with ADHD. Now she's a certified ADHD and family coach and is one of our valued coaches here at Take Control ADHD. Aviva, welcome to the ADHD podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. So nice to have you here. It's great to be here, Nikki. And we're going to talk about good stuff. We are talking about natural approaches to navigating ADHD. So uh, this is something that I know uh, we talk a lot about in coaching because medication is obviously something that uh, it can be a very important factor in uh, navigating ADHD, but there are some other things that you can do to, to uh, uh, piece together this puzzle that we're looking to piece together when it comes to ADHD. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, why don't we start out, Aviva, tell us a little bit about what you think it means um, when we're talking about natural approaches to ADHD. Yeah, I, I think it's, I consider it more like a lifestyle approach to be your best self with ADHD. And like we said before, like medicine can really help. And, um, you know, for, for most people, there's, they see some positive impact from medicine, but not everyone wants to take medicine or some people want to try other things first, or they realize at some point that medicine isn't the whole picture. Like they are getting some advantages, some, some improvement from medicine, but they realize there's still things that are really hard for them. So I, I think that that lifestyle approach and these things that we're going to discuss today are these other pieces that, you know, could be part of your ADHD toolbox or even kind of a foundation for, for ADHD management that, you know, mm-hmm. it's not just um, a way to treat ADHD, but I consider it that it's kind of the basis, like the building blocks for good ADHD treatment. So let's talk about some of those things. What, what would you consider to be more natural approaches? Okay, so there there are a few things, but I think the the three most pivotal and there are other ones that are also important are like the diet piece, exercise, and sleep. 
And all those kind of, <laughs> they're like a, a blessing and a challenge for ADHD. They all have their like particular things that make it hard for ADHD. Like when the sleep can be really hard for ADHD. And there's some issues associated with diet and exercise that make it harder to start. Um, but they're, they're all things that can have a tremendous impact, a po- tremendous positive impact on ADHD symptoms. And some of the other pieces are um, mindfulness is a, can have a really positive influence on ADHD symptoms. Even, I read this is kind of cool, can change your brain. That the amygdala, the emotional center of the brain, which can be, you know, the cause of ADHD meltdowns actually shrinks. So people that regularly practice mindfulness and the prefrontal cortex, which is the source of like all our executive functions actually grows. But I thought that was like a really neat thing because medication is just making those changes while you're taking the medication. You know, it could work great creating that dopamine, creating that neuro, neuro I can never say this word, that other neurotrans, neuroepinephrine. Mm-hmm. Um, mm, good but job. it's not making those changes long-term you know, even beyond the medicines out of your system, you're going to have that crash, which people don't like. But if you decide to, you know, practice mindfulness regularly or exercise regularly, exercise also does make some long-term changes. Um, You're not going to just feel those benefits right then, but there are benefits that are going to be lasting. Let's start with, let's, let's start breaking them down kind of one at a time. If we think about like just, and knowing that full, full well, that they work in concert with one another, let's start with sleep. We've talked about sleep in particular, um, you know, around transitions. People with ADHD have a hard time getting to sleep. They have a hard time waking up. They have a hard time staying asleep. Sleep is a real challenge. If you were to start with, with, you know, approaching sleep and the benefits of sleep to those with ADHD once you develop a practice that you can live with, what would that look like? So I think you first have to figure out where that person is with their sleep, you know, where, where their struggle is. Is it in falling to sleep, falling asleep? Is it actually getting into bed? Are they staying up till three in the morning as they're doing whatever? Is it once they get into bed, you know, they have a hard time shutting down or they're worrying or whatever it is, or are they waking up in the night? Um, are they waking up in the morning yeah. feeling well rested, even when they get supposedly a good night's sleep? Um, well, I think you just you just said something that's real that that triggered for me that um, sleep, uh, you know, it isn't just sleep. Sleep is the the row of dominoes that have to start falling much earlier because of time blindness. When I'm awake, like I might not get in bed until three a.m. Not because I don't want to get in bed uh, at, until three a.m., but because I don't even know it's three a.m. until I I come out of a of ADHD you know phase. Yeah, time blindness and hyper focus. You know, you yeah. can get really stuck in an activity. Um, it may be something very enjoyable, but you get stuck in it. And that's kind of one of the things with managing ADHD and sleep is not to get into one of those hyper-focused activities for you close to when you, when bedtime, if bedtime is 11, 10 o'clock, you don't want to pick Mm -hmm. up, I don't know, you know, a video game or a a video game. I was just going to say a game control. (laughs) Besides the screens, besides Mm -hmm. the the screens, you know, affect melatonin and and that blue light is, is not good for sleep. But aside from that, but, you know, I, mm-hmm. it's even like we, we talk about the things that, um, you know, that we should do to calm ourselves down. We have some tea and we pick up a book. Right. So last night I totally did that. And I got so hyper focused on the book. I didn't go to sleep until one thirty. The book was awesome. And it was on paper. It wasn't even on a screen. Like I'm doing the right stuff. And my brain still hates that idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. you chose the wrong that- book. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do anything right. I need to choose what? Wood woodworking for the Amish yes. for young Amish professional. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, because honestly, and I'm and I'm being I'm yeah. actually being very I, I, yeah, about I this. would agree. <laughs> yeah. Because I know that like when people a lot of people will listen to podcasts, mm-hmm. right, before they go to sleep. And if you're or audiobooks mm-hmm. even, but if you're listening to something that's really piqued your interest, then yeah, you're gonna be awake yeah. and you're gonna want to finish it. So you do kind of want to read or listen to something that's a little bit, you know, boring. Yeah. Yeah. That balance between interesting enough that you want to do it and boring enough that you won't continue to do it. Or has a set end. Con- yeah. Continue, has a set yeah. ending, you know, like yeah. it's maybe it's a short story. Maybe it's like you said, listening to a podcast, you know, as a set ending. I do like uh, podcast apps that uh, have timers. Like I I listen in Overcast, which is kind of a niche uh, podcast app, but it has a timer that will stop at the end of an episode. So you can't, you don't just press play and listen to every episode you've downloaded. You press play and you say, I want you to stop, you know, either in a time or when this episode is over, stop playing it so Mm -hmm. that, you know, if Mm -hmm. I do drift off, that's, that's good. I don't, you know, listen to everything, but at least it, 
it won't keep playing after I'm drowsy. Well, and I know like with uh, one of the things that I'll talk to clients about and I do myself is having sort of a boundary of when you will not start a new show. (laughs) <laughs> right. So yeah. if you're watching TV and you know how those streaming services just play next and they it's just so mm-hmm. easy to go into the next one. Um, but like for myself, I don't start anything after 9 p.m. So if it's 845, I might start like a shorter show or an hour show because I know I want to be in bed by 10. But um, I, I just know I'm not going to start anything new at nine. So it's kind of putting a, a after nine. So it's putting a rule to where you have to like remind yourself of that rule. So you might need a reminder somewhere or a timer, you know, just to say, okay, you're getting ready to go to bed. Don't start that or whatever. Um, cause it's not going to come naturally necessarily, but I think setting those kind of boundaries around, uh, time can be really helpful. Yeah. I agree with you, Nikki, on that, that the, the timers can be especially helpful because it's easy to just, you know, listen to another episode or have that boundary in your mind. Mm-hmm. But when you get into the flow of things, it's, it's harder to stop, but that shut off really, <laughs> Usually, you know, because yes. you have to make that extra effort to turn it back on or, or make change yeah. the right. settings on a right. timer that's already there for you. Uh, I'm sitting here d- digging through my Netflix settings to see if I can turn off that autoplay. The rumor is you can, uh, that you could say, don't play the next thing, but man, they make it hard to find. Oh, of yeah. course they do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Of course they do. So, uh, so sleep. I I appreciate all of this. It makes me sad that I I now have to start being uh, conscientious about the kind of book I read. I feel like I just did a good thing by picking up a book and <laughs> drinking tea, and I'm already doing it wrong. So, uh, but You're I can not doing I can do wrong. this. I can do this. Um, yes. Uh, make better choices with my with my reading. I can I can absolutely do that. More pamphlets. <laughs> more boring pamphlets to put me to sleep. That's right. So when you're going to bed, yeah. now you can have that, you know, great novel yeah. or whatever it is that you're reading later. Well, at and a this, different time. this, I think also ties into if we back into out of sleep, ties into exercise. Uh, let, let's talk about the benefits of exercise to the ADHD body. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just backtrack just a bit is how exercise influences sleep. You know, when you have a regular exactly. exercise regimen, it helps you to sleep fall asleep easier and stay asleep better. So these, all these kind of things we're talking about today kind of have ripple effects with each other. And that's, you know, not to say we want to bite off more than we can chew in ADHD fashion and then try tackling everything at once, but they really do have ripple effects. When you start to exercise, you're going to sleep better. When you start to exercise, you're usually going to eat better, drink more water, maybe have more protein. So there is that kind of like, you know, domino effect in a positive way between these lifestyle ADHD habits we're talking about. But um, yeah, so for ADHD and exercise, um, it's pretty amazing. They, you know, we're talking about beef a little earlier with mindfulness, how um, how mindfulness can be even better than medicine in some ways because it changes your brain. With ADHD and exercise, we're producing those same neurotransmitters that, that dopamine and the neuroepinephrine that um, you produce when you take Ritalin or Adderall or any of the stimulant medications, but also um, you're producing the serotonin and those other like happy chemicals that make you know, help your mood and positivity, which is going to help your productivity and help you to, you know, we know how much our mood affects our, po- our focus and helps us to get things done. So all those um, executive functions are going to be positively affected as well as like our mood and our overall like happiness. Is there a form of exercise or a classification of exercise that that is better for ADHD than another? Should I be climbing, like free climbing or So I would say at or... first to say anything you enjoy, you know, that you're going to want to do. But then if you really, really want to know, there are things like yoga and martial arts because they require a certain type of focus and concentration that I guess they're building more of that ADHD muscle than um than it's any other cardio sport, but really anything you're going to get out there and move, but it could be gardening, you know, that, or, you know, mowing the lawn, but, um, something that you're going to do and you're going to enjoy is probably the biggest factor. I was talking to a client, uh, uh, I get, yeah, it was actually earlier today. Um, and she was talking about, there was a, a moment, uh, last week where she was just feeling really, really stuck, wasn't motivated to really do much. Um, and she went outside and took a walk 
And she said a couple of things happened. One is that she felt better after she took the walk and felt uh, more motivated to, to get some things done. But she also realized that she probably took the walk a little bit too late because by the time she came back, it, it was done with work and now I have to be at home mode. And so she still felt this a little sad, frustrated that it didn't happen earlier. So I'm curious, and, and then what she's going to work on is, you know, can I get that walk in a little bit earlier to see if I can't kick off that? So there, you know, she's combining exercise, which is obviously really good, as we just mentioned, but she's also talking about going outside. So I'm curious what your thoughts are around just being outside. What does that do for the ADHD? Yeah, brain? yeah. So we're talking about executive function a lot earlier. So we think about throughout the day, we're using our executive function and we have like this executive function battery. And as we are making choices, as we are forced to focus or manage our time, that battery gets depleted. And if we continue with that battery metaphor, being outside replenishes that battery. It does something to our nervous system. We don't quite understand how, but it replenishes that battery. You said like she felt more motivated when she came back in. It was like refilling her battery. So it is, it is pretty cool. And I, I've also learned, which you know, that even just looking at a view of nature, and it can even be pictures on your wall, um, does also have an effect. Not as great an effect as actually being outside and being in nature, but it still has an effect. So it's just something to keep in mind that even when you're, you know, sitting in your office, you can be looking at a, a nice picture of the beach or looking outside at the grass and trees. And even if you live in the city, you can have a gorgeous, uh, you know, picture on your wall that you can look at, you know, nature and get replenished in, in some way. That's interesting. I never thought about that. Well, and just getting that that dose of, you know, fresh green oxygen in your brain, I right. find that incredibly rejuvenating. Um, uh, just being well, outside. and Pete, you've done this before because I remember you and I working together and going to your house yeah. and we were working on a project and, and you purposely said, let's go outside, take a couple of breaths. 60 and seconds. We'll come back in. Yeah. 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 And it was, it really does make a huge difference to have that little break. Well, and, yeah. Um, and, and it could probably help with transition. Yeah. Totally. Totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. Totally. We have a little, we have a cul-de-sac outside. And so we could just do a quick lap of our cul-de-sac and it takes about a minute, minute and a half and you come back in and you're a new person. Like having mm -hmm. a prescribed, like this is, and, and you talk about transitions, having a prescribed transitional element that says, I'm going to walk out this door and walk into the door to something else. When I'm ready to mm -hmm. change, that can be very helpful. Literally, yeah. like you're you're closing the door, you're walking, and then you're opening up mm -hmm. a new one. It's like, I, I like that. Yeah. I'm going to remember that. Yeah. That's great. That's great. I put a bunch of like so, framed doors throughout the house, just like stage doors. And sometimes I just walk through them and I make an entrance. And, and no yeah. one's there. No one's there. No, no one's there. No one cares. <laughs> but you still feel really but I like important. To, I like to make an entrance everywhere. I, I also everywhere add I what you said about the 60 minute break is it doesn't have to be a half an hour walk or 45 minute yeah. cardio session. Even those like little bursts of exercise, 10 jumping jacks between clients mm -hmm. or right before a meeting or getting outside and walking around the block or going up and down the steps in an office are going to have a positive impact. And that, that little impact mm -hmm. adds up throughout the day. I, Nikki knows I shared with mm -hmm. her about a client who had three full-time jobs. I'm not joking. He had like Literally, he was working 24-hour shifts on two jobs, like two 24-hour shifts. And the third job, he was working like more nine to five. And he was trying to fit an exercise. And we spent many sessions trying to figure out what he could let go of because there literally wasn't a minute in the day. And mm -hmm. um, we figured out he wasn't willing to let go of any of the jobs for various reasons. One, he was nearing retirement. He was expecting a pension. And the other one, he was kind of holding on to it until he was secure in the third job. But anyway, what we figured out is during those transition periods, he did, had a pull-up challenge. So that's another thing that helps a challenge, making it into a challenge can excite the ADHD. He made a pull-up challenge at the fire department. Um, between calls, they'd get back and do, I don't know, however many pull-ups they could fit in, 20 pull-ups or something like that. And they did it over time. So um, he was able to, and also he did that between um, clients. He had an e, uh, like a virtual job between um, patients. And he did some other kind of, I don't know if it was push-ups, pull-ups, whatever, some other kind of exercise that he did to transition. But also he was starting to meet his exercise goals of getting stronger. Wasn't a 30-minute break ever. Mm -hmm. 
but little by little, he was getting stronger and healthier. So I, you know, I think there's this, Mm. this people are held back by, I don't have half an hour. I don't have 40 minutes or I can't do cardio, but those little bursts, almost anyone could do. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. That's a really good point because you have to think with ADHD, it's very easy to go Mm -hmm. all or nothing. I I need to do the whole class or I don't do it. Right. And so we're saying, no, it's okay to do these little bursts of exercise, which feels with myself who does not like exercise, like that feels a lot easier to like even get started. (laughs) If I only have to do 10 pushups, I'm like, I'm okay with that. Well, it goes back to building those tiny habits, right? Associating, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. associating a a couple of pushups with something that you are absolutely doing already uh, might just be the answer to doing doing any pushups at all. Right, right, right. right. Well, and habits, Pete, you bring up a really good point because a lot of this stuff is around, well, you mentioned it, Aviva, actually, these are lifestyle Mm -hmm. things that we're looking at. This isn't necessarily something that you just, there's no end or beginning or end of sleep or exercise. And we didn't even talk about nutrition (laughs) yet. So, um, So I'm curious, like, yeah. How do these become, when you're coaching clients, how do you build in the habit piece of having this be a lifestyle change? I think first is just the awareness that habits take time because people can, you know, start something consistent for a week, maybe two, maybe three, and then they go on vacation or they get sick and the diet or the exercise or the sleep are really off. And then they beat themselves up and they, they stop because, you know, they, I failed, you know, so, so why, why continue? But to realize that it takes time and that we do fall off. Everyone falls off. Even long-term habits that people have had for years, there are times when you're going to fall off, but to get, just get back right on, on it again. And I think another thing that's really helpful for ADHD is seeing your progress, like seeing your consistency in some way. And there are a lot of apps that help with that, whether it's exercise or diet or sleep, even mindfulness, which we probably get to a little bit later, there are apps that can help you to see visually your progress. And that can be very powerful. It could be also, you know, someone has, um, one of the important things in coaching is to ask like, what, why is this important to you? What's your why here? Why do you want to lose weight? Or why do you want to exercise? And just being really in touch with what's important about that particular thing for you and having that reminder, like maybe it's a picture on the wall of, um, I don't know, the way you looked when you were 20 pounds thinner, or maybe it's a quote or some kind of souvenir you have from vacation that reminds you of what your goal is. But having that like visual piece that keeps you always thinking about what your why is. So when you fall off track or you feel like discouraged, you keep, you know, keep that motivation up. Always David Hasselhoff, just so you know, the picture for me, it's always going to be David Hasselhoff. (laughs) You just want to be like David? Got to be like David. Let's talk then about nutrition and speaking of making good choices. um, I saved this one, hopefully because we'll run out of time right in the middle of it because it's such a hard thing for yours truly to face. Nutrition and the ADHD brain. I think, you know, ADHD coaching is a little bit different than regular coaching. And there is always that education piece. If people don't understand how certain nutritional changes can make a big difference in their ADHD. There's that education piece. What do they know about ADHD and nutrition? I mean, there's always the, the good nutrition in general, like healthy, healthy nutrition guidelines are always to be helpful in general, like eating whole grains and fruits and, you know, um, all that, all that stuff. But I think knowing particularly where ADHD fits into good nutrition, like the emphasis on protein, how that's important for building neurotransmitters. Um, why, it's particularly important to have to be careful about your sugar intake or your white flour, like refined flour intake, and how that causes the um, you know the the spikes, you know that the, the, like the, for the, that little high, but with a big drop off, and how protein affects that also because protein kind of evens it out a little bit. Um, this is an education piece, and just to find out where they are at with these things. You know, I think uh, there's so many challenges with ADHD and eating. Medicine can be one of them. You know, not having an appetite can be can be a problem. You know, having getting kind of addicted to like that white flour or the sugar because of the high it gives you that 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 burst, but with with that drop off can be also an issue. You really, needs to be curious and ask them like, where they are with these things and where they would like to be. Or if there's been a time in their past, they remember eating more healthy and how that felt for them. Um, you know, what, 
what would you like things to be like? You know, are you looking for more energy? Are you looking to lose weight? You know, what are their, what are their goals there? You know, as far as, as far as good nutrition, is it focus? Is it primarily ADHD related or is it related to bigger, you know, lifestyle goals? Again, the tiny habit piece is is really important, especially for me when I think about like how hard it is for me to eat regular meals when I'm not in a rhythm with my family, um, you know, because sometimes my wife travels and my kids are, you know, largely out and about doing their own thing and out in the world. And I might be here working out of my home studio alone and the kitchen is way too close. Yeah. And uh, allows me access to just constant snacking if I'm not careful. And so there's the the both when I'm when I am eating, like what kind of alerts or alarms or triggers do I have to remind me to eat something? And when I do eat something, is the right kind of food available to me at arm's reach? Yeah. Like yeah. the easiest stuff is on a shelf and <laughs> it's not, I don't have to prepare. But what can I do when I'm in the flow to actually prepare some things for me to eat later for future Pete to not make bad decisions? And that's a thing that mm-hmm. is a constant work right. for me, but right. it, it actually, I mean, it, it does help. It helps. Yeah. Yeah. To have that mm-hmm. list of go-to mm-hmm. snacks that for you are healthy yeah. that you enjoy. You know, it could be something that's ready made like a good protein bar or a ready made, mm-hmm. you know, protein shake. But if there are other things, fruit and nuts, you know, to, to have those things accessible and available. I had a client that kept his, you know, work snacks right literally on his desk because he, otherwise he wouldn't see them, he'd forget about them. So it could be yeah. you have them really, you know, we, we see what we do, you know, and and we we want to have those things we want to do in front of us. It's interesting because we just had a a, a coaching with Nikki <laughs> yesterday, last night, which is one of the benefits of the uh, Platinum uh, Discord group. And we were talking about meal planning yeah. and we were talking about, you know, how to do it and what helps. And what's so interesting is there were a couple of people that were saying that they will make like 22 cups of rice and then they batch it up like they use the freezer or the um yeah the freezer thing whatever and then freeze it and then somebody else was talking about how they do it with sweet potatoes Mm -hmm. they'll freeze their sweet potatoes and it's such a um an easy thing because you do it all at once right and it's easy to make rice it's easy to make um sweet potatoes especially if you've got one of those pot things that make everything instant faster. Pot. <laughs> instant pot. <laughs> yes, thank you. Instant pot. Uh, but it was really interesting to hear him say that you like you can take a bag of rice that's frozen and put it in the mm-hmm. microwave and put it in for a minute and have a nice, you know, side with whatever else you want, like whether it's vegetables or, you know, you can make it easy. And so I think that's probably part of looking into what you're eating. I know if I have it in my house, I'm going to eat it. Mm-hmm. So I have to prevent you know, buying stuff that I know is not good for me too. But you also have to have that convenient right. piece as right. well. You know, I'm, I want to throw in just one more. You're talking about the Instant Pot, which is enormously helpful in this regard. The other is a dehydrator. If you can find a dehydrator mm. kind of cheap, you can you can really help yourself with the kinds of snacks that you might otherwise eat packaged. Mm-hmm. When you're in the flow, right. make a whole bunch of stuff. Like we, we make uh, cashew bark which is kind of amazing. It feels like something you might find in Lord of the Rings, like the elves would eat it. You take a big bag of of unsalted cashews and some dates and a little vanilla, and you put it all in a blender and make a paste, and then you spread it out on a dehydrator sheet and dry it for a day or so. And when it comes out, it's like, it, it is bark. It's like a chip. Wow. But it is the most wonderful snack. It's sweet. It's protein because all kinds of nuts and dates and it's not bad for you. And it gives you that little like that continuity boost throughout the day that I Mm. I really need. And so we keep that on hand. We make Mm. that by the truckload and and keep it on hand for the snacking when I otherwise might grab a chip. Yeah, Um, totally. That sounds like an awesome snack. I want to get back to what you were just saying earlier, Nikki, about batch cooking. And I think that really takes advantage of the ADHD hyper focus, like that strength, because people do I, what I've seen anyway, people do a lot better, like hyper focusing on like a long cooking marathon on a Sunday when they have time off and cooking a lot of stuff and freezing it rather than each night starting over and figuring out what they need to do. I mean, even if you have a chart, you know, Monday's this, Tuesday's that, a lot of people find it easier to just do a cooking marathon, have it in the freezer and they have what to take out during the week. Yeah, there's, I know meal planning is 
is not easy. It can be um, really frustrating, but I do believe you can make it ADHD friendly mm-hmm. and to keep practicing and trying different things because it does yeah. help. Yeah. It really does help, you know, to stay on course of, of how you want to eat. Because when we don't have, I know for our family, if we don't have a meal planned and we don't have the, the, the stuff in our kitchen, we go out right. and we probably do that a lot more often than what we need to be. So uh, there is something for sure about that of, of, of uh, helping that nutritional piece of it. So I am curious because we uh, both work with ADHDers. We understand that uh, when, when, when people come to us to help them, um, especially with these kinds of things like sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, we want all of it to be happening at once. Like I want all the changes and I want them all right now. So how do you guide people to getting started without the expectation that it can all change right now? You know, just knowing that that education piece that that in the past, what has happened when you tried to, I don't know, go to the gym every day for an hour. Um, how did that go for you? For most people, it doesn't really last very long. And just understanding that if they do things little by little, then they're more likely to build the habits that they want um, over time. Then you have to really just ask them about their own experiences, because I think most people have examples that they can point to where they built habits that stuck, whatever, whatever they were. And there are times when they failed to build habits. And most likely it's because they took on too much. Um, so Mm -hmm. if they can see that from their own experience, they're more likely to understand and, and to, you know, to go at a pace that works. And and, and it goes back to what Pete was saying too. I think tiny habits start small, right? You know, you could do a little bit in each area, but start small and see if that, if that helps and makes a difference. You mentioned mindfulness. You've been, you know, that's kind of been weaved into the conversation a little bit. Um, how do you speak to your clients about mindfulness? What do you think? it is. And, and how is it different from meditation? I think it's really important that we kind of just, you know, make the, yeah. So I, I, I think that meditation is more of a formal practice. Um, and there's different types of meditation. I consider mindfulness, you know, any activity or any time you're just in touch with what's going on right now in the, in the present moment, what you're seeing, feeling, hearing, smelling, tasting, what's going through your head, without judgment, just being in the present moment. And, you know, I think meditation, people have these images, like what goes through your mind when you hear the word meditation? Like what? I'll ask people that question. I mean, I can ask you, like, you heard the word Mm -hmm. meditation. What do you associate with? A a person in a nice, beautiful garden, you know, in the sitting down pose with the hands (laughs) up and yeah. And birds chirping. It's it's a beautiful image, but at the same time, I think most people with ADHD (laughs) don't see themselves that way. There are ADHD meditators that do meditate in that formal way, but I think it's really the exception mm-hmm. rather than the rule. So to, I, I think I try to portray mindfulness as something that really fits in anyone's lifestyle. You can be mindful while you're taking a walk, talking about taking two things together, being outside, three things actually, being outside, um, getting some exercise and being mindful. Those birds chirping, the sun on your, the sun on your back, um, you know, what your, your feet feel like in your, in your shoes, just being, feeling what you're feeling right now. It could be while you're taking a mm-hmm. shower that you're just in the present moment. Mm-hmm. It could be, you know, you're sitting on a chair. It doesn't have to be that formal practice of breathing. Um, and it's okay for other thoughts to go for your mind and to get distracted, just to try to bring yourself back mm-hmm. to where you are in the present moment. And it can be honestly doing any activity you're normally doing. And it can be for 30 mm-hmm. seconds at a time. It could be for a minute at a time. It doesn't have to be 30 minutes, hour, two hours sitting down in that field or in that garden, Nikki. Did you, I, I, I think this, the whole idea of feeling like you are, like your choices are limited. Like we've had some folks in the chat room who are already talking about like when I don't have, when I feel like I don't have the right food in place, I just don't eat. Or I live in a place that just doesn't give me access to nature. How am I supposed to make those kinds of choices? How do I create a natural environment? Like when, when I feel like and I have a worldview that I am, I am limited in my options, how do I open myself up to those things around sleep, exercise, nutrition, uh, you know, and, and natural 
mindful living. Yeah. Thoughts? Yeah, I think that's a really broad question, but I can give you an example. Um, I had someone I was working with who lived in the city. She was an actress and an artist, and she needed to live in the city. And um, we were coaching for a while, and one time I was speaking to her, and she sounded like a different person. She just seemed so relaxed and at peace. And I said to her, what, what's different today? Like, what's, what's going on? Like, you sound so different. And she said to me that she was at her grandmother's, um, had a house up in New Hampshire, somewhere upstate. And it was in the woods, and she'd taken some walks. And I was like, wow, like, you, it sounds like transformative for you. And she's like, yeah, it really is. And she was, we talked about it for a while. And then I asked her, like, you know, how do you think you can get that bit of nature while you're living in New York City? We tried to just brainstorm because she needed to be in the city. That's where her work was. There wasn't really an option to move to New Hampshire or Maine. But, you know, what we figured out was she loves to ride a bike. She could ride in Central Park. You know, there are parks. So she can sit and read a book in the park. There is like that little bit of a getaway in the city. Um, and she could still be proactive in planning regular trips out to nature. Maybe she goes on a camping trip on a long weekend. Maybe she goes up to her grandmother re regularly. So it's to see what's possible within your circumstances. Look at what's possible and to really explore maybe outside of what you would normally explore. Because it doesn't have to be a traditional exercise mm -hmm. program like what, what what we've talked about. It doesn't have to, you don't have to live out in the country to enjoy nature. Right. So I think it is, you know, um, and sleep, that's something that is definitely, um, you know, something you keep practicing yourself, right? Um, and and figuring out what, what you need. Uh, but yeah, I would definitely recommend, first of all, I would ask what, what's making you feel like it's limited? Like, I would be curious to know where they're feeling limited, um, especially when it comes to like nutrition, because um, that might be something that you can just do a little bit more research on and figure out a little bit more on how to make it work for you. Um, but that's definitely something I'd be curious about is where that, that thought, those thoughts are coming from and then looking at those, those opportunities and what are you willing to try? Right. What are you willing to practice? and see if it works. Um, I like your idea of Eva, and this, this never dawned on me, but like having the pictures of nature, you, you know, the people that don't see you right now, the, um, our discord community can, you have this beautiful picture <laughs> behind you that of mountains and, uh, it looks like a river probably. And I mean, it's beautiful. I have a picture, um, of the beach in my office. And mm -hmm. so it's like, you don't, I never really thought like I could just look at that picture and I bet you it would calm me yeah. down. Yeah. It was know? really interesting. I read that because I, I have a son who, um, he's a big nature photographer. He lived in Colorado for years and he got into nature photography. So I have a lot, this is one of his, but I have a lot of pictures in my environment, not just necessarily in my office, but in my house. And I knew that it made me happy, but I was thinking it was because, well, my son took these pictures and he's really talented, but I realized that it's, it's more than that. It's more than that. There really mm -hmm. is something going on with our nervous system when we look at nature. And I need a plant. Yeah. That's, you know what I mean? Mm. Like, I need a plant. Like, I'm like looking at my thing. stuff. Everything's so, like, I've got so much gear and tech in my space and old archives of historical gadgets on my walls. I need a plant. I have no living yeah. thing besides me in my <laughs> office right now. And your dog. Right. He's he not even here right sometimes. now. I had been forsaken even... by my own podcast. So, so that's actually <laughs> another really cool way you can bring nature inside, even in an urban environment, is plants. Some people have like a little window box with flowers or even I've seen, I was at someone's house recently that they had growing on their counter herbs. It was some kind of like contraption mm. that you can grow oh. like herbs. Like it was so cool. We have one of those and uh, I'll post a link to it. It's fantastic. Um, it is, uh, it has a little light and a timer and you put water in it and all the goodies and you put little seed pods in it and then it grows yeah. your, whatever yeah. you want, thyme or, I mean, we, mm -hmm. we have one that's lettuce. Like it'll grow little baby leaf lettuce and you cut it up and eat it, but it's always growing in the corner. That's what I need to move in here. I was going to say. our herb mm -hmm. garden. Uh, <laughs> I think my right. wife would kill Absolutely. me. She likes it. Uh, anyhow, that is uh, <laughs> really, really helpful. And um, just a great, <laughs> great reminder that I need mm -hmm. more life and breath well, in my Well, it's, it's a good reminder, too, of like, remember when we did our joy uh, presentation at the uh ADHD conference yeah. that we want to surround ourselves with things that make us happy. We want to uh, have our surroundings be 
you know, n- not necessarily nature, but that's definitely something you want to add. But anything, yeah. it could be pictures of family that make you happy or flowers or whatever, but being able to, to surround yourself in that, in that space that, that gives you that, that little piece of joy that's so important to have every day. Truly. For sure. Truly, truly. Well, thank you, Aviva, so much for being here. I know we're just touching the surface here. There's so many things. Uh, as as when we were talking about what to talk about, like e- each of these things yeah. could be their own podcasts, their own series of podcasts. Right. Uh, but I think the, the the biggest takeaway is just understanding too that there are there there's pieces to this puzzle. Right. And there's a lot of different factors. And uh, I will often tell clients if you didn't get a good night's sleep, if you ate a donut for (laughs) breakfast and you went straight to your office and sat down, you're not going to have a great ADHD day. (laughs) You know, it's going to be loud uh, because it's, uh, and and even with the medicine, it might get a little bit better, but it's still going to be loud because it's all, it all works together. Yeah. Adding just a little on to what you just said is that it's always good to check in when you're having not just a bad ADHD day, but a bad ADHD week. How are you doing with sleep, diet, exercise? And a lot of times you find, oh, I didn't sleep last night, the, the baby was up or I ate really poorly. And that's really contributing factors that made that day or that week difficult. That's such a good point. And, and you know, one other thing that sticks out to me in this whole conversation, not once, have we had any conversation about questionable supplements or things that you buy or things that, you know, crazy things that I like, we're not talking about any of that. Everything we're talking about when we talk about natural approaches to ADHD living is simply doing things with your body yeah. that mm-hmm. will help you live more comfortably with your ADHD in the world. We're, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that is that is as basic and as pure as as I think we could possibly be. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for being it was a here. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to the uh, Take Control ADHD team. We're so glad to have you. And uh, right. great to be able to introduce you to uh, the audience on the podcast. Aviva, we sure. Uh, if anybody wants to learn a little bit more about Aviva, you can find uh, more information about her and the kinds of coaching she does over at Take Control ADHD. We encourage you to do just that. I'll put a direct link to her profile page in the show notes. Thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. We appreciate your time and your attention. And don't forget, if you have something to contribute to the conversation, we're heading over to the Show Talk channel in our Discord server, and you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the deluxe level or better. On behalf of Aviva Nirenberg and Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you right here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. (music) 